Hey there, and welcome back to the Board Game Sherpa, the channel whose goal is to take the fear out of learning new board games and put the fun back in. Well, it's July now, and Gen Con 2024 is only a couple of weeks away, and I know I'm really getting excited about going with my friends. I always have such a great time there. If you're thinking about coming, especially if you're a first-timer, go watch my two essential tips for Gen Con videos to give yourself a good primer on what to expect while there. There's also a walkthrough from last year's show so you can see exactly what you're getting yourself into. Go check them out. I'll put the links in the description. Since my June video, a lot more games have been listed as coming out for this year's Gen Con, and I've been hitting the Board Game Geek preview site pretty hard looking for the next batch of games to tell you about. And I tell you, you guys really need to start hitting my YouTube channel hard to help me afford all the games that I have on my not-so-short list of games to buy. Like the June video, I based this list on the Board Game Geek preview of Gen Con data along with my own super secret board game Sherpa algorithm with help from my board game Sherpa minions, my personal Sherpa Johnny Rocks, and my new Sherpa apprentice and tactician, No Facebook Eric. So let's cue the title and let's get started. <laughs> As always, I'm really sorry for the butchering of these wonderful designer names that I'm about to do. I know some of you are tuning in to see how bad I say the names, but I'm really not doing it intentionally. Number one, Tir Nanog, aka Land of the Young. Designer Isaac Shalov and Jason Slingerland. Artist Marales Barens and Brigitte Indelicado. Publisher Grand Gamers Guild, according to the publisher. In the Irish myth cycles, the land of Tir Nanog is the realm of the Otherworld, the place where the fairies lived and heroes visited on quest. It was a place just outside the realm of man, off to the west, where there was no illness or death or time, but only happiness and beauty. The golden path to Tir Nanog is opened once more, and the greatest Celtic storytellers have gathered for a once-in-a-lifetime journey. When they return, they'll bring with them tales of the creatures they met and the adventures they lived. Over time, these stories will become a saga, and the most epic saga will live on forever. Journey to the other world in Tir Nanog by placing storytellers between story cards in the shared grid. When all storytellers have been placed, in reverse player order, draft cards and add them to your hand. From your hand, you'll then add cards to your personal tableau. One card to hand, one card played. At the end of five rounds, score each row according to the rules on its corresponding goal card, and earn points for having the most connected story cards of each color. Highest score wins. Tir Nanog is one of those games that it caught my eye. It's got an Irish flavor to it, which is kind of cool for me, but I don't know how it's going to play. So I'm going to go to Gen Con, hopefully I can demo it, and then decide whether or not I want it on my short list or not. Number two, Foundations of Metropolis, published by Arcane Wonders. Designer, Emerson Masucci, with art by Joe Shawcross. According to the publisher, in Foundations of Metropolis, players will compete over three rounds to be the greatest architect in the city by purchasing deeds to empty lots and constructing new buildings on them. More complex buildings require more lots, but will bring you even greater prestige. The player with the most prestige will be appointed Grand Architect. Gameplay is the same in the standalone game as in Foundations of Rome, but with polyomino pieces and a brand new theme. Foundations of Metropolis looks like an amazing game, but it's a big game if it's anything like Foundations of Rome. Um, and I don't know I have the space for it. But... It looks amazing. Number three, Pampero by APE Games. Designer, Julian Pombo with art by Ian O'Toole. According to the publisher, with no natural resources, the government Uruguay is concerned about the country's dependence on imported fossil fuels. As a consequence, it's seeking to increase the share of domestic resources, of which the most feasible are biomass and wind energy, as well as employing end-use energy efficient measures to increase its energy security. In addition, the government aims to use the intended growth of the domestic energy sector to foster its other objectives of increasing economic growth and creating employment. Pampero is a hand management, card driven action selection game. Every player has a starting set of eight cards to be played in their own tableau, which contains two rows of spaces to activate actions on the different sectors of the board. Each turn, you have the option to play a card to the leftmost empty space of either row or retrieve all cards from your tableau. After three actions, a special phase takes place, consolidation, during which you retrieve the rightmost card from any row, generate batteries from stored energy, collect income, and advance the game timer. The player with the most money at the end of the game wins. Pampero looks like an interesting game. It'll definitely appeal to some of you. Number four, Comic Hunters, the English edition. Published by Arcane Wonders, designer Robert Coelho, and artist Diego Sa. According to the publisher, after a long search in several comic book stores and online stores, you managed to acquire the most important comic books of all your favorite heroes. Well, almost all of them. Some rare and important editions are still missing from your collection. The first appearance of your favorite villain, that special edition that influenced a generation of storylines, 
the spectacular debut of the new uniform, the memorable confrontation with the arch enemy, and the valuable number one. You already know where to find them, and you also know that you are not the only one in search of these precious gems. Will you be able to collect all the comics needed to be recognized as the greatest collector of all time? Comic Hunters is divided into three rounds. In each round, players will visit three of the four locations where they can purchase comic book cards. At the end of the round, players must place cards on the table to start or expand their collections. When adding a comic to the hero's collection, the player will move his markers on the icon tracks according to the spotlight icons of the new card in play. Number one, first appearance, new visual, special edition, and memorable. The further the player advances on each track, the more points he or she may get. In addition, each collection scores based on the number of cards it contains. After three rounds, the player with the most points is acclaimed as the greatest comic book collector of all time and wins the game. This game fits pretty close to my heart. I'm kind of a comic book collector, and although I'm a DC fan over a Marvel fan, the comics are real. I mean, this, this is branded with actual Marvel comics. They previously published this only in Brazil, in Spanish. And I almost bought the game in Spanish on eBay just because I wanted this game so much. But it was really expensive, so I didn't. But I am so looking forward to this coming out of Gen Con or soon, soon after. This is a game I want. It's probably top of the short list for me. Number five, Jekyll and Hyde vs. Scotland Yard, published by Mandu Games. Designer Gaetan Bujanet and Olivier Sifier. With art by Vincent Dutrade who also did After Us. According to the publisher, Jekyll and Hyde vs. Scotland Yard is a cooperative, trick-taking game for two players that's a standalone spin-off to Jekyll vs. Hyde. You're Dr. Jekyll, the kind doctor and valuable friend, but you're also the infamous Mr. Hyde, who is hunted by Scotland Yard for the many misdeeds committed in the city of London. Your objective is to maintain the balance and the duality of your personality while staying ahead of Scotland Yard's investigation. This is a story-based game in which you have to achieve the objectives of every chapter of the story to complete the game. When I was looking at the pictures of this game, and I really love the artwork, then I realized it was by Vincent Dutrade, who did After Us, and which is a game I love. So this game is going to be on my uh, shortlist this year. Number six, Gnome Hollow by Levity Games and The Op Games. Designer Amon Anderson, with art by Amon Anderson and Patrick Spazianti, according to the publisher. Since the beginning of time, gnomes have been the humble caretakers of nature. In secret, they emerge from their underground homes to maintain meticulous rings of mushrooms, known to the human folk as fairy rings. But the work must be done quickly, because as soon as the mushroom path is finished, the mushrooms are ready for picking. Who will be the cleverest gnome and harvest the most mushrooms by the end of the season? Gnome Hollow is a spatial, tile placement, worker placement game in which you grow a tabletop garden of mushrooms and flowers. Every piece is hand-painted watercolor that captures the whimsical feel of gnomes in nature. Turns are deceptively simple. Players place tiles in the garden and move a gnome to take a single action on the turn. But placing a tile and taking an action can create play combinations that are intensely satisfying. Players strategically place tiles and develop rings of valuable mushrooms. Once a ring is completed, they harvest each mushroom and eventually carry them to market to sell for the shiniest treasures available in the hollow. Small mushroom rings offer small rewards. Larger mushroom rings offer richer rewards. Completing a new circle automatically increases your score. The player board automatically calculates your growing score every time you move a ring marker to unlock your latest reward. This means that every completed mushroom ring offers new strategic choices and important bonuses for individual players. For all you gnome fans and all you mushroom fans, which seems to be a trend at this year's Gen Con, this is going to be a very hot game for you guys. Number seven, Escape from New York by publisher Pendragon Game Studio, designer Kevin Wilson with no artists listed. According to the publisher, you go in, find the president, bring him out in less than 24 hours, and you're a free man. In Escape from New York, an adaptation of the John Carpenter movie of the same name, you play a snake, brain, Maggie, or cabbie, and attempt to rescue the president and his precious tape and bring them to safety while dealing with the gangs of the most dangerous prison in the world, all of Manhattan. You will play the roles of the heroes, exploring the dangerous streets of New York, searching for the president, his case containing the government tape, and a diagram of the bridges so you can escape from the city without stepping on a landmine. You can work together, searching for these three things, or you may decide to secretly satisfy your own personal objective at any moment during the game, escaping from New York alone and betraying your companions. Whatever your decision you'll be, you must face the bands of Manhattan, headed by the Duke of New York, who will hinder you by moving prisoners and bosses to eat up as much of the short time frame you have to complete your mission. This is a game recommended to me by my own personal board game sharper, Johnny Rocks, and if he recommends a game, you better take note. I missed a Kickstarter, but Johnny Rocks didn't. He's going to be painting the miniatures as soon as he gets them. So when he brings them to the table, that's when this game is going to shine. Number eight, Nocturne, by publisher of Flat Out Games, by designer David Aizi, and artist Beth Sobel, who's done a few games in these countdowns. According to the publisher, Nocturne is a puzzly, spatial bidding and set collection game of sly mystics set in a whimsical moonlit forest illustrated by Beth Sobel. In Nocturne, you play as a fox mystic casting magic spells to collect an assortment of enchanted items. You compete against rival mystics, each of you deciding when to cast the most powerful spells to move through the forest the most cunningly to secure the best collection. Each turn you decide which items are the most valuable to you and which ones will hold the other mystics back. Through two rounds, Twilight and Moonlight, 
players compete to collect the strongest sets of magical items like firebird feathers, creature skulls, glowing mushrooms, mysterious eggs, and rare herbs. These items have value when collected in specific sets, but can also be combined to fulfill recipes needed for concoctions. Each round, you begin with a set of numbered tokens that represent your spell strengths. These tokens are used to cast spells and bid on a grid of items and special actions on the forest floor. Once you cast a spell, your rival mystics will have an opportunity to cast a more powerful spell onto an adjacent item, hoping to compel it towards them and prevent you from collecting what you need. As the forest is explored, different conditions of magical control will restrict pathways leading to strategic situations which players can corner cast and secure multiple items with less powerful spells. If your spell casting comes up short, you can always make an offering to the forest sprites, magical mice that have their own cache of treasures they may share with you giving you further options to expand your collection. I wasn't too interested in the game, and then I started looking at it, and I love the cover. The, the cover's gorgeous. So I'm gonna take a look at this game when I'm at Gen Con. Number nine, Reef Project, by designer Martino Cicerera, Federico Pier Lorenzi, with art by Zazana Kalakowska and Piotr Sokalski. Again, sorry about butchering your names. According to the publisher, despite covering less than 1% of the ocean floor, coral reefs are estimated to be home to about 25% of all marine species. Unfortunately, these vibrant underwater cities are dying. Climate change and its effect of rising sea temperatures is devastating the colorful algae that give coral reefs their brilliant use, resulting in coral bleaching. Furthermore, other threats like pollution in its various insidious forms and overfishing are disrupting the delicate balance of reef ecosystems. And so scientists from various fields, along with researchers studying the ecological complexity and significance of the reefs, are collaborating to address the myriad challenges facing these ecosystems. During the game, players take on the role of researchers and saviors of the oceans. You will sail the seas, hire a crew, explore the coral reef, clean the ocean sectors of any pollution, and try to accomplish as many missions as possible. On their turn, players may choose to recharge or travel. If they recharge, they gain the rewards from a VP track. If they travel, they may deploy reef balls, move their ship, play mission cards, and perform various actions. The game is played for a variable number of rounds. When a player has crossed the 45 VP threshold, the end of the game is triggered. After an additional round, the final scoring takes place, and the player with the most victory points is the winner. I really like how VP Project looks on the pictures. It has a very Sky Team vibe to it. It may not have anything to do with Sky Team, but it feels like the, with, the, with the boards and all that. I'm going to demo this, but this is a really good chance this is on my short list. Number 10, Harvest, publisher Keymaster Games, designer Trey Chambers, and art by Tierra Connor. According to the publisher, salutations neighbor, and welcome to Furrowfield, the commonwealth of free beasts. Ours is a budding farm town with soil ripe for planting. In Harvest, you take on the role of a farmer, each with their own unique pension of working the land, and choose a farmhouse with its own special round-to-round -round benefit. Each round, you draft sunrise cards that give you a one-time income and determine turn order for the round. Following that turn order, move your wheelbows around town to gather resources that you'll use to manage your fields. Plant seeds, tend the land, and harvest crops to make money and score points. Clear land to expand your farm and construct buildings that make your land more efficient and give you endgame bonuses. By the end of harvest season, the farmer with the most points wins. Harvest sounds like a very straightforward game. I feel like I know how to play it already based on the description. Check that out at Gen Con. Number 11, Cafe Barras. Published by Kids Table BG, designer Roberta Taylor, and art by Cindy Monroy. According to the publisher, everyone in town is looking for a cozy little cafe where they can relax with a good book, something to nibble on, and of course some delicious caffeinated beverages. As a capybara with a love for coffee, it's always been a dream of yours to open your own shop. Now is the perfect time, but you're not the only one opening your doors in hopes of enticing customers. Rival coffee shops are popping up all over town, and it's up to you to ensure that you have the right food, drinks, and decor to turn your drop-ins into regulars. Put together a delicious menu and decorate your shop to capture the perfect aesthetic. You might even have the busiest little cafe in town. Each turn, you play a card from your hands, either buying it as a food, drink, or decor item for your cafe, or serving the customer on the card and earning money. If you meet a customer's needs completely, they become a regular and earn you extra end game points. Cafe Barras is a card drafting tableau building game brought to you by the creative team behind the Critter Classics Creature Comforts in Maple Valley. Designed by Roberta Tella and featuring illustrations by Cindy Monroy, it plays two to four baristas in about 30 minutes. I'm not really sure if this is a kid's game. It's published by a company called Kids Table Board Games, but it doesn't sound like a kid's game, so I'm not really sure. They'll check it out. Number 12, Weirdwood Manor, published by Grey Ridge Games, Designer Mike Cassie with artist Anna Early, Steve Palmer, and Sean Richardson. According to the publisher, Weirdwood Manor is a cooperative board game that marries great adventure gameplay with some Euro-inspired underpinnings. As you and your group of valiant companions battle to protect Weirdwood Manor and its enigmatic ruler, Lady Weirdwood, from an invading fey monster and his clockwork scarab minions. The manor is a mysterious and magical place where rooms and the pathways between them can shift as time progresses. The game features a unique temporal mechanic. Every time a player or a fey monster takes an action, time will move forward in the game, and the connections between the rooms will shift via unique rotating corridor rings on the game board. 
players have some agency in how to use their actions to affect how quickly or slowly time moves, but beware, if the players use up their allotted time and have not defeated the monster, they lose. You will assume the role of one of six asymmetric design characters as you battle against one of the three different fey monsters, each with their own unique mechanics and loss conditions. You will make use of dice drafting, card play, resource management, and location actions as you move through the ever-shifting manner in pursuit of the fey monster and his minions. You can also recruit additional companions to aid you, and you will improve your character's abilities as you earn experience. Each turn, players will use their own deck of cards to take one primary action. Rooms they move to can offer additional actions and benefits. As well, players can make use of their own unique player and companion powers. These combinations can create varied and potentially powerful chains of actions on a player's turn. However, after each player's turn, the Fey Monster will act using their own custom deck of cards. As the game progresses, the Fey Monster's threat will grow and things will become more dire for the players, so they have to work together to solve the challenges in front of them. The game offers deep tactical choice and a degree of unpredictability that will make traditional leader quarterbacking virtually impossible. Players will truly have to strategize as a group to succeed as the threat deepens. And so, if the players can defeat the Fey Monster before time runs out, or before the Fey Monster completes his own unique victory condition, the player will win the game and have kept Weirdwood Manor safe for now, until the next threat arrives. I didn't realize the game had already been released on Amazon, and it's $90. It's a little more than I want to spend on a game I haven't played, but it's a gorgeous game based on the Kickstarter videos and the pictures. Go check it out. Number 13, Lore. Publisher, All Play Games. Designer, Satoru Nakamura with art by Anka Gavril and Daniel Porfiri, according to the publisher. Welcome to the world of competitive fishing. Players compete to collect the most points by reeling in fish cards. To catch a fish, players roll the dice to beat the fish's target number, as well as meet any specific requirements on the card. Whoever completes these requirements and is closest to the target catches the fish. Players secretly bid on how many dice to use before the round starts. Bid less dice, you go first, but use more dice to make it easier to catch stuff. Most points wins after the deck of fish cards comes out. Will you play aggressively and use fewer dice, or will you count on your opponents to be too risky? Let's fish. Other than that description, there's really not a lot of information out on lore. Not a lot of pictures either. So, I don't know too much about it. It looks like it's going to be a small box game, but we'll see when it comes out. Number 14, Ring of Chaos, by publisher Beetle and Grimm's Games. Designer John Ciccoloni and Matthew Lilliard. According to the publisher, welcome to a world of adventure, strategy, and chaos. In the depths of an ancient temple, the all-powerful Ring of Chaos beckons. Assemble your party of four adventurers, each bestowing unique cards and powers, for they are your key to strength and survival. Engage in a race against rivals and perilous temple guardians, where every decision counts and strategy reigns supreme. Will you harness the ring's power to summon the gods of chaos, or eliminate all competition to stand victorious? With multiple paths to triumph, Ring of Chaos offers fast-paced, competitive, and seriously fun gameplay. Embark on this epic quest, seize the ring, and control the chaos that awaits. This is another game recommended by my own personal sharper, Johnny Rocks, so you know it's going to be a good game. I don't know much about it, and there's not a lot of info out there on Board Game Geek, but when Johnny Rocks gets it, I'm playing it, and we'll see how it goes. Number 15, Sears Catalog, published by Bezier Games, designer Taylor Reiner, with art by Rob Lukakta and Christine Mitzik. According to the publisher, the latest edition of the Sears Catalog has everything you need for stopping werewolves. Can you limit yourself to the essentials in time to save the village? Sears Catalog is an almost shedding card game in which each player tries to get rid of almost all the cards in their hand. Each round, players have a unique set of artifacts that gives them asymmetric abilities to help manage their hand of cards. When one player runs out of cards, the round is scored. Each card is worth negative one, but if you have five or fewer cards in your hand, the lowest value on those cards is worth positive points. However, once you have five or fewer cards, you can no longer voluntarily pass, so holding on to a high value card near the end of the round hoping for a big payout can result in total failure. Okay, I'll admit, Sears catalog hits very close to home for me. Back in the day, I used to work at Sears and in the catalog department. And when I was a kid, I used to go through the Sears wish book every Christmas to find all the cool stuff that I was going to want for Christmas. This game looking like the Sears catalog, but for vampires and werewolves and witches, that's a big plus for me. I already pre-ordered it last night, so it's not even on my short list anymore. Number 16, Dracula vs. Van Helsing. Published by Mandu Games, designer Maxime Ramberg and Theo Riviere, with art by Weberson Santiago. Publisher's description is, Many years after the confrontation with Van Helsing, Dracula landed in Whitby, England once again. The citizens of Whitby sought help from the vampire hunter, Professor Van Helsing. Will Van Helsing defeat Dracula before he transforms all the inhabitants into vampires? In Dracula vs. Van Helsing, each player controls one of the title characters. Van Helsing must remove all of Dracula's life points to win, but if Dracula turns all four inhabitants of the same district into vampires first, Dracula wins. The game lasts at most five rounds. Each round, players play in turn, starting with Dracula, drawing a card, then discarding that card, or swapping it one of the cards on their rack to trigger their discarded cards. Cards come in eight types, each with their own effect. 
Instead of drawing and discarding a card, a player can call for the end of the round. In order to choose this action, at least six cards need to be in the discard pile. After the opponent plays one last turn, the round ends. Otherwise, the round ends when the deck is empty. At the end of the round, players compare the five cards on their rack. Each card corresponds to one of the five districts on the game board. If Dracula has the higher value card, one of the humans in this district is converted into a vampire. If Van Helsing is higher, Dracula loses a health point. If one of the game winning conditions is met, the game ends immediately. The artwork on Dracula and Van Helsing is amazing. It kind of reminds me of the Jekyll and Hyde game from earlier. I love vampires. I'm going to see how this game plays, but it's on my short list. Number 17, Mycelia, published by Split Stone Games, designed and illustrated by J.J. Neville. According to the publisher, Mycelia is a dynamic game of tactics in the competition for space and resources to create your own mushroom kingdom. The game follows the life cycle of fungi, a journey of creation, expansion, death, and rebirth. In game terms, growing mushrooms to score points, sporing them to expand your mycelian network, and eventually seeing them decay to unlock special actions. On a turn, a player has two actions to perform from the six options available. Using your decay actions, stealing spores, and blocking other mushrooms are just some of the ways to get ahead in the game. Players can evolve their own playing style, perhaps playing more aggressively to steal other players' spores or disrupt their mycelian network. Or perhaps playing more defensively to try to protect their own area and spores. The board is made up of triangle tiles that represent different environments and nutrients that the mushrooms need to grow. These tiles can be added to the board by the players, so the board is always growing and evolving. Mycelia incorporates beautiful and accurate botanical style illustrations with over 69 mushrooms that can be found in the wild. There's definitely a mushroom trend going on this year. Um, this is like the third or fourth game that has mushrooms somehow involved in them. It's a beautiful game. It's a very mushroom and science-based game, so it might just take off just like Wingspan did. Number 18, Hi-Fi, published by Smirk and Dagger Games. Designer, Andre Taruya Eckenberg, with art by Luis Francisco and Diego Sa. According to the publisher, in 1974, the band The Meeples broke up during the recordings for their vinyl album. The A-side of the unfinished album quickly became cult followed by fans and critics around the world, turning into one of the most intriguing legends of rock and roll history. 50 years later, the band has finally reunited to finish the B-side with the help of a team of the best musical producers in showbiz. That's you. In Hi-Fi, players start their turn by spinning the record's rondelle on the turntable to choose an action within their reach, or they can spend production points to achieve one of the other actions. After resolving these actions, players allocate audio cards to the five studio tracks, earning points based on the buttons in that producer's equalization track and what's in the studio track. When a player allocates a guitarist card, each player who collaborated with the equalization of the guitar earns points. When elements such as sound wave or time track positions match, players can perform bonus actions. Each round represents a song recorded on the A side of the album that will help players gather information to aid B side recordings. After listening to all the songs on the A side, six to eight rounds depending on the player count, the game ends. Whoever contributed most effectively to the construction of the tracks on the album's B side wins. Okay, to be honest, I already pre ordered this one. It's so cool, the box that comes with, if you open it the right way, it looks like the old school record players. Also, it has a production board that looks really nice when it's, out, when it's laid out on the table. I've managed a rock band in the past, and I've been around a lot of production studios, and this looks amazing. If anyone's into music and production, this is the game for you. Number 19, Spectacular, published by Chili Fox Games. Designer, Elif Svensson and Asmund Svensson, with art by German Bonn. Sorry about the butchering. According to the publisher, in Spectacular, you are creating and developing your own animal park for vulnerable species. In order to preserve the species, you must ensure breeding within each habitat. During the game, you select animal tiles and dice where the dice represent food for the animals. The color of the dice must match the habitat color of the animal tiles. Each turn provides crucial decision making where you need to consider whether to draft the die of a certain value or ensure an animal tile which may or may not be available again. At game end, for each area of connected tiles of the same habitat, you score points for the sum of the dice in that color. However, points are only awarded if dice values of one or two are placed on certain family tiles within the habitat. Over the course of the game, you'll also build watchtowers, which will score you points for all three dice adjacent to them. To make your park even more spectacular, you also aim to collect as many different species as possible, with increasing points awarded for greater variety. Finally, the player with the most points wins the game. Spectacular offers simple rules, quick setup, short playing time, engaging puzzle, and can be played by one to six players with little downtime, even with higher player count. There's a lot going on with Spectacular. I really like the simple rules and the solo play. And the cover art is amazing. I gotta check this one out. Number 20, From the Moon, published by La Boite de Joux. Designer Johan Guppy and Gilles Lasfargs, with art by Miguel Coimbra. Sorry for butchering your names. 
according to the publisher. In From the Moon, players are representative of factions trying to complete missions departing from a moon in order to help humanity survive elsewhere in the galaxy. Indeed, the fate of the Earth is sealed, and time is running out. The plan is to launch three survival missions before all life on Earth ends. To do that, each faction will contribute by building parts of the ships and build their own lunar base to store the necessary resources. In the end, which faction will be the most suited to lead the future of our race out there, far away in space? The components of this game look amazing, but it's a moon game, and I already have two moon games on my shelf of shame. I still may get this. Who knows? <sighs> I'm going to be broke after Gen Con 2024 with this list and the previous list. So that's my July update for 20 more games that you need to see at Gen Con 2024. I won't have time to do another game update before Gen Con, but keep checking back for more of my Road to Gen Con series, where I'll give you all the latest info on cool stuff to do at Gen Con and Indianapolis. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe and give a big thumbs up. Sharing the video won't hurt you either. It really helped me out, and together we can bring more new players into the hobby, which will help you when you're trying to find more people to play your favorite games with. Right? Deal? See you next episode.